Hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming, and let's get started. So, I'm Matthew, and today my colleagues and I will be talking about how we are making the Android runtime, also known as ART, faster in Android Q. We will also be showing you uh, some, both some internal knowledge about ART as well as some best practices, such as using the Report Fully Drawn API as well as when to use object pooling. And now, a recap about how ART works. So ART is the software layer in between the Android operating system and the applications. It provides an execution environment for running both Kotlin and Java language applications on Android. To do this, ART does two things. It processes DEX files, the internal format of Android applications, through a hybrid model consisting of interpretation, just-in-time compilation, and profile-based ahead-of-time compilation. ART also manages memory by having automatic reclamation through a concurrent compacting garbage collector that we introduced in Android Oreo. So an update on profiles in the cloud. So ART has had profiles that contain information about application usage uh, on Android since uh, NuGet. And until recently, these profiles are only local to the device. These profiles are collected by the just-in-time compiler and are saved to device storage during application execution and later are used to optimize the application. Since these were only locally stored on the device until recently, this meant that applications had to run a while, have their profiles saved, and then we had to optimize the application uh, when the phone was charging or when the device was charging in the background. To address this, we introduced a new service called Profiles in the Cloud, uh, which was announced last year at Google I.O. And today, we're going to be providing some more updates about how that's going. So before we uh, dive into Profiles in the Cloud, let's take a closer look at what's inside of a profile. Profiles contain detailed information about application usage, including what methods are run, and what classes are loaded during both startup and during a steady state of the application usage. This enables ART to compile the methods that are the most important to machine code, as well as uh, optimize the application for startup by prioritizing code that is run during startup for performance. Profiles in the cloud enable downloading the profile alongside the application during uh, installation and then optimizing the application during installation. This means that the users get the performance directly after installation and no longer have to wait for the application to get optimized when the device is charging in the background. So here, we've observed speed ups of around 15% faster application startup directly after installation. So now let's uh, dive into how the whole profile in the cloud process works. So the main idea here is that applications usually have commonly shared code paths between a multitude of users and devices. So this means that most users are going to have generally the same use case for startup and ap the application usage in general. So what we want to do with profiles in the cloud is have the initial users bootstrap performance for the rest of the users. And this is often uh, takes advantage or benefits from the fact that developers roll out the applications incrementally with alpha beta channels. So once an application is installed, the profiles are uploaded to play and are aggregated into what we call a common core profile for the application. And in future installs, this common core profile is downloaded alongside the application and used to optimize the application during installation. So this improves both the steady state performance as well as the startup. I'd like to note that Android P also has API support that non-play devices can leverage. As for numbers, as you can see here, YouTube has a large startup improvement around 18% from profiles in the cloud, and other applications also have uh, substantial improvement. This is field data of uh, Google applications collected from uh, Pixel devices. And one of the best parts of all this is that developers and users get the benefits for free. 
Developers don't have to write a single line of code to enable the profiles for their applications, and users don't have to take any action to get the benefits. And right now, around 80% of installations on devices with Google Play services use profiles in the cloud. Another interesting observation is that the profiles in the cloud seem to show that only around 20% of application code is commonly used. This could indicate that there are opportunities to reduce code size by removing unused code in applications. And now, let's go to App Startup. We have done some improvements in Q, and I'll be going over some of those. In Android Q, we have done three major uh, new improvements. We've improved the application images originally introduced in Android Nougat to provide a larger startup improvement. We have added pre-forking of application processes to accelerate process creation on Android. And we have added a new generational garbage collector. So starting with application images, uh, recall that application images, uh, as if you've seen other uh, years I.O. talks, are actually serialized heap snapshots containing the classes that are the most commonly used during startup of an application. So this optimizes the performance by uh, shifting the work of loading those classes from happening during startup to happening ahead of time in the art ahead of time compiler. So the application image is generated by the compiler taking both the application, APK, and the profile as inputs, and then using the profile to know specifically what classes are loaded during startup, and including only these in the application images. This is done uh, during installation if there is a profile from the cloud present. Otherwise, it's normally done in the background when the device is charging. So how have we improved application images in Android Q? Well, we recently observed that string interning caused specifically by using string literals in application startup was taking a large amount of time. So we added an optimization to include the string literals that are commonly used during startup for the application inside of the application image. This is accomplished by leveraging the profile to know specifically what methods are executed during startup. So as you can see here, there's around a 2.5% improvement on some applications. And this is a selection of first party applications running on a Pixel 2 XL. And now, let me hand it off to Chris for pre-forking application processes. Thank you, Matthew. Hello, everyone. My name is Chris, and I am here to talk about some of the changes we have made to the Zygote in Android Q to help improve uh, application starter performance. For those of you unfamiliar with the Zygote, this is the process in Android that all applications are spawned from. This design allows us to take several application, uh, several steps that are common to all Android applications and perform them before the applications are launched. Unfortunately, in previous versions of Android, there were still several application agnostic steps that had to be performed after the application was launched. These include such things as process spawning, thread creation, driver loading, and resource cleanup. In Android Q, we're introducing the unspecialized app process pool. <laughs> unspecialized, app, uh, unspecialized app processes are created and perform these application agnostic steps off the critical path of application startup. This produces an average speed up of approximately five milliseconds uh, for most applications on a Pixel 2 device. But more importantly, it forms a foundation for further improvements to application startup. So now let's take a look at some of the changes we've made to the early stages of app startup uh, to make it faster. On the left, we can see the launching process from previous versions of Android. It involves three communicating processes, one of which must be created during this critical launch window. It also involves inter-process communication, or IPC. And this requires the zygote to wake up, block, unblock, and send a message to the system server. All of these steps take resources away from the operating system and the uh, application that the user is trying to launch. On the right, we can see the new, much simpler app launch process in Android Q. The zygote has been completely removed from this critical path. The new, also, the new process that will become the application already exists in the system and has performed these application agnostic steps already. By removing the zygote, we also eliminate an entire inter-process communication round. 
And this means that the new application can talk directly to the system server and not uh, wake up the zygote and consume system resources. In a couple slides, I'm going to talk about some of the uh, metric and investigation we've wor work we've done in Android Q to uh, help improve application startup performance. But I wanted to briefly mention the metric that is directly impacted by these changes, which is time to first slice. Time to first slice is a measure of how quickly we can begin running application-specific code. And as we can see in this graph, there's a fairly uniform improvement, again, of approximately five milliseconds to the time to first slice metric for these seven apps on a Pixel 2 uh, device. However, this is just the beginning for the uh, speed ups and improvements we can see from the using unspecialized app processes. Follow up work that is currently in testing uh, shows an additional speed up on the order of, uh, ten of tens of milliseconds. The best news for users and developers alike is that all applications will see these improvements without requiring any changes to their application or the way that they use their device. So now I'm going to talk briefly about the measurement work that we've been doing in Android Q. When performance tuning software is complicated as an operating system, it's very important to get a deep understanding of what is happening, when it's happening, and how long it is taking. To this end, we have spent a lot of time looking at traces and log files over the last couple months. Uh, we've also developed several new tools for extracting actionable and useful insights from this large corpus of data. One of these tools uh, is publicly available to you, and that's the Startup Analyzer script. This script uh, will extract detailed information about startup events from trace files, including startup duration, scheduling status, and uh, binder transactions. One of the most important questions that this work made us ask ourselves is, when does application startup end? Well, there are many criteria that we can use to, uh, that might signal when startup is finished, including when the first frame of the user interface is drawn. And this is certainly a useful definition. It's one we can use to optimize uh, performance. But it doesn't tell us when the user perceives the application to be usable, which is what we consider to be the gold standard for application startup endpoint. Unfortunately, we don't have a way to automatically detect when this happens. We do, however, have an API call that developers can use to tell us when you think it happens. This makes it easier for us to identify the application startup process for individual apps and make sure that we optimize the things that are important to your app. So if you would like to help us uh, speed up the performance of your application, I highly recommend that you use this report fully drawn API call. So thank you for your time. And at this point, I'm going to hand the stage over to Roland for a discussion of the garbage collection work that we've done in Q. Thank you, Chris. Hi, everyone. My name is Roland. And I'm going to present the improvements we've made in our garbage collector for Android Q. In Android Q, we've improved our concurrent copying garbage collector in two ways. First, by adding support for generational garbage collection, which makes GC cheaper overall. And second, by using a two-phase collection strategy, which makes garbage collection more precise and able to reclaim more objects. During the development of Android Q, We've also reevaluated the benefits of object pooling versus standard allocation in art. In the last section of this talk, we'll share with you our findings and um, new recommendations regarding object pooling. But for now, let's have a look at garbage collection, generational garbage collection. In Android 8 Oreo, we introduced a concurrent copying garbage collector or CC collector in art. This year, we're adding support for generational collection to this collector. In Android Q, the CC collector alternates full heap collections and uh, young generation collections. These young generation collections only process a fraction of the heap. They are cheaper and almost as effective as full heap collections. Before we look at generation collection, let's have a look, quick look at how the concurrent copying garbage collector works. The garbage collector in art is a concurrent copying one. It is concurrent because it runs at the same time on an app's thread. And it does not require a long stop the world pause. This works thanks to a cooperation between the GC and the apps code. All accesses to object references are instrumented in the runtime uh, with what we call read barriers. And they ensure that the app does not see a stale object. The GC is also said to be copying 
uh, because it moves live objects in memory by making a copy of them and reclaiming the space that held the original objects, including the dead objects. This copying strategy means that the GC is compacting the heap and preventing fragmentation. Let's see how this works. Copying collector traditionally splits the managed heap in two spaces, a from space, which contains the object currently allocated and used, and a to space, to which live objects are moved during garbage collection. During a GC cycle, the collector traces the heap. It follows root references to manage objects, uh, for instance, from a thread stack, and marks all objects reachable from these roots to compute the set of live objects. The unreachable objects in dark red in this illustration are the ones which are not visited by the collector. Reachable objects are copied to the two space as they are being marked by the GC. And likewise, all other reachable objects living in the from space are copied to the two space as they are being marked, thus compacting the heap. At the end of the collection, the objects that haven't been moved are the dead ones, and, uh, because they are not reachable. And the GC can then reclaim the memory used by the from space. Finally, the from space and the to space are swapped, and new allocations happen in the new from space. So that's heap compaction in a nutshell. Let's see how this works in art. So for practical reasons, art CC collector does not use two semispaces, but a region space composed of 256 kilobyte regions. As an app's memory needs grow over time, new regions are located to, cre to create space for new objects. As in the previous example, uh, we're highlighting unreachable objects in dark red color. At the beginning of a GC cycle, the garbage collector makes a decision for e each region in use. The first option is to evacuate a region, uh, which means moving all live objects out of it and reclaim the memory backing the region at the end of the cycle. Uh, this makes sense if there's a good proportion of um, dead objects in this region, um, because evacuating it means um, it will help compact the heap and free some physical memory. But if most of the allocated objects in these regions are actually alive, uh, there will be little benefits um, to uh, evacuate it, and uh, maybe some cost because of the object copies. In that case, uh, the GC might decide to keep the region as is, and we call that an unevacuated region in uh, dark green in this uh, diagram. Until Android Q, the decision to evacuate a region uh, or not was based on information from a previous GC cycle, which is not optimal. Uh, later in this talk, my colleague Lokesh will talk more about this. Tracing and marking work similarly to the previous example, but instead of copying um, our evacuated object to a fixed uh, two-space area, they are copied to a freshly allocated region called an evacuation region. If this region fills up during garbage collection, another region is allocated, and so on, until the whole heap has been traced. At the end of the GC cycle, the two space is the union of all the evacuation regions and the region that has been allocated for new object allocations. Evacuated regions eventually are reclaimed, uh, and their memory uh, pages are returned to the system. Now that we've seen how Art's concurrent collector uh, works, let's, see at, uh, let's have a look at this generational version. Even if the CC collector does not evacuate all regions, it has to trace all the objects. This is known as a full heap collection. But consider this. If the GC were to process only recently allocated objects, it would in general collect most of them and for a fraction of the cost for, uh, for full heap uh, collection. This is, the, this is what we call the generational hypothesis. In most cases, young objects are much more likely to die than old objects. Art's generational CC collector introducing the concept of young generation collection, only tracing recently allocated regions. These are called minor collections, uh, as opposed to full heap collections, which are called major collections. Uh, there's a GC heuristics which tries to uh, use minor collections first, and uh, it runs major collections uh, if needed. In the young generation collection, we handle newly allocated regions specially. These regions are the ones which have been allocated since the previous GC cycle, and their objects are much more likely to be unreachable. Therefore, these regions are the only ones evacuated during a minor collection. And they're also the only regions which are being traced during a minor collection. All generation objects have survived at least one collection, and they are more likely to be still alive, so they're not traced during a minor collection. Overall, 
this results in a much faster GC cycle. By tracing young generation regions from the roots and, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. In order to only trace objects in the young generation, uh, we need to determine their reachability. To do so, we need to track references from the roots to the young object, as we did in the full heap collections. But we also need to trace uh, references from old objects to young objects, because the old objects are not traced. We track such young, young to the, um, old, old to young object references using a remember set. Uh, mechanism which keeps tracks of um, references, um, um, objects whose fields uh, have been modified since the last GC cycle. Minor collection. Oh, sorry. Yeah, by tracing the young generations uh, from the roots and the remember sets, we can identify live young objects and copy them out of the region without the need to trace the whole heap. And this is the main benefit of minor collections. Minor collections do not process old generation objects that could have been reclaimed in the full heap collection. We call that floating garbage. They will eventually be collected during the next full heap collection. Let's now see the impact of generational CC on, on art's performance. To assess the impact of generational CC collection on arts, we've measured the average CPU time spent in the garbage collector thread on some GC intensive benchmarks. We use the H2 benchmark from the DACAPO suite, which is an in-memory database benchmark, as well as our internal Google Sheets benchmark, because both are good examples of um, allocation and garbage collection workloads. On average, the, ge the generational CC collector is 38% faster on H2 and 33% faster on Sheets, while compared with the non-generational garbage collector that we shipped in Android P. Uh, this is the direct result of uh, a younger generation uh, collection being cheaper in terms of CT CPU time. So to put it in a nutshell, Using short if object is now cheaper. And also, as a consequence of these improvements, we expect that because we're spending less time in uh, the garbage collector, this will benefit the device battery life. Improvements in garbage collection often highlight uh, traders between CPU and RAM usage. Generational garbage collector may keep some objects a bit longer uh, in order to speed up the overall uh, GC execution. To talk more about these, uh, how we can improve these trade-offs and uh, heap compaction, I'm handing it over to Lokesh. Thank you, Roland. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I hope you still have some stamina left for more technical stuff. Uh, so let's start off with uh, talking a little bit more about how heap compaction works in CC. So as you can imagine, uh, uh, the more live objects there are in a compacting region, uh, the lesser uh, memory you would reclaim if you were to compact it. And so it makes more sense to only, for a higher rate of investment, to only compact those regions which have considerable garbage in them. And that's exactly what our concurrent coping collector does. Uh, we maintain a per region liveness stat which uh, indicates how much live data is there in a particular region, and based on that, decide which regions are worth evacuating and which are not. Another interesting fact about the CC algorithm is that it, during a GC cycle, it only goes through all the reachable objects only once. While this is a very uh, uh, useful um, fact about any uh, GC algorithm, because it, uh, it shows how uh, efficient the algorithm is. Let's see how it affects the heap compaction uh, decisions that we make. So this is a hypothetical timeline of some, Z some app's execution. And as you can imagine, during the execution, uh, periodically we need to perform GC cycles in order to reclaim memory which is consumed by unreachable objects so that future uh, object allocations can be served. And since uh, CC till Android P was not generational, so all these GC cycles work on all the reachable objects. And therefore, um, I'm calling them full heap GC cycles. So when we start off with the first uh, GC cycle, uh, by the time we visit all the reachable objects, uh, we know precisely which region has how many live bytes in them. And therefore, we can gather the liveness stats that I talked about in the previous slide. Um, as the time goes by, due to the execution of application threads, the heap mutation 
would result in more objects becoming unreachable. Un unreachable. Uh, however, by the time the next GC cycle is executed, where you would actually use the stats that you gathered in the previous GC cycle, uh, those liveness stats no longer uh, show you the, uh, the liveness at that point in time. This leads to what Roland earlier described, floating garbage, which is the re unreachable objects that the garbage collector knows about, but it cannot collect them. Um, and of course, as in the previous GC cycle, by the end of this GC cycle also, since we have gone through all the live objects, we gathered the liveness stats, which then are used in the next GC cycle, and this goes and on. This is how decision making works in Android P. Now let's see how introducing generations into this affects the, uh, the decision making for region selection. As Roland described earlier, the benefits of generational GC is that we can reduce the number of full heap GC cycles by replacing them with more frequent young collections which are much more lightweighted as they only work on young objects, young reachable objects. And therefore, uh, what this leads to is that you would have lesser G full heap GC cycles, but also that the time lag between two full heap GC cycles would increase. And so given that, when we start execution, the first GC cycle being full heap GC cycle, we compute the liveness stats, as I described in the previous case, However, every time when we perform a young collection, we cannot update these stats because we only go through young objects. And since we don't go through all the reachable objects, it's not possible to you know, uh, update the liveness stats. And by the time we reach the next full heap GC cycle where we actually use the liveness stats, they become much more stale than what it would have happened in case of Android P or earlier. And therefore, it, lead, it leads to larger amount of floating garbage. And this goes on and on and on. Given the limited availability of memory on you know, phone, mobile devices, it makes sense to uh, ensure that this floating garbage is minimal. And, uh, and the cause of that we identified is clear that the outda uh, outdated liveness stats is what is hurting us. So. We fix the issue by improving the heap compaction by replacing the full heap GC cycle with uh, another algorithm which, you, which is two-phased, where the first phase would trace all the live reachable objects and compute the liveness stats. And then the second phase, based on these up-to-date liveness stats, figures out which, region, which regions deserve to be compacted and then performs compaction. This way, we reap both the benefits of generational GC by ensuring that young collection remains as it is, as well as we fix the problem of outdated liveness stats. Let's see, using the same example that Roland was earlier using, how this new algorithm works. So let's, for, uh, let's assume that our evacuation criteria, criteria for any region is that if it has less than three live objects in it, then it deserves to be compacted. So in this example, as you can see, that all the four regions which are in use, they have less than three live objects in them. So by the time we finish the first phase, which goes through all the reachable objects, we have determined that all the four regions have the liveness stats less than three objects, and therefore they deserve to be evacuated. And by the time we finish our full heap GC cycle, we managed to move all of them into a single region, thereby reclaiming all the four previously used regions back. Coming to what should it lead to the, uh, in, in terms of improvement, the direct improvement of this change is that after every full heap GC cycle, we should be uh, collecting more free bytes uh, back from the uh, garbage collector. And to measure that, we use the same set of applications and benchmark that Roland dis earlier described. And as you can see that for H2, the average freed bytes improved by more than 178%, whereas for sheets, it improved by 68%. That's pretty cool. Uh, in terms of impact of all the, both the GC improvements that Roland and I talked about 
on the overall improvement on the uh, benchmark score, uh, we again ran some benchmarks. And we observed that for H2, the, um, the score improved by more than 15% for both ARM and ARM64, whereas for Sheets, it improved by more than 5%. All right, enough bragging about improvements in Q. Let me touch, about, touch a different topic. Let's talk about object allocation and object pooling before I conclude. I'm sure many of you must have experienced this. You start writing an app and with standard object allocation, you know, simple way, using new operator. But as it grows more and more, you start either observing that there's too, just too much GC activity going on, or you are spending too much time allocating new objects, or maybe just somebody said that GC is ineffect inefficient in general and we should avoid it. And then an idea comes to your mind. What if I can cheat the garbage collector? What if instead of giving those L objects once, they are, once I'm done using them, uh, one, giving them back to the garbage collector, I could just keep them around in pools and use them again and again? Isn't it obvious that this should lead to less garbage and therefore less GC activity, and also that we would be avoiding the allocation cost? Given that in the last few years, uh, the uh, garbage collect Android's garbage collector has, has made several improvements, we thought it's a nice time to actually relook into it and see if it really makes sense to pool objects or not. So we developed a microbenchmark uh, with the idea of basically gathering two uh, sets of metrics. One is, what is the allocation overhead uh, for standard allocation versus acquiring from an uh, object pool? And second is that, what is the overall CPU overhead of completing the microbenchmark? So starting with allocation overhead, as you can see in this chart, that as you increase the number of fields of the object that you are pooling, the overhead of pooling an object versus standard allocation is almost the same. So from allocation overhead's point of view, it actually does not make much sense to pull the objects. Going to the CPU overhead, this chart shows the best case for pooling. And obviously, as expected, the best case was that basically there is no garbage collect collection activity at all. And therefore, the total CPU overhead of completing the benchmark in case of pooling was lesser than standard allocation. However, there's a catch. The catch is that the best case loses its practicality as soon as you go beyond a test program and start having more and more complicated code. Why? Because you can't be pooling every type of object in your app. You, you just can't do that. And therefore, we thought we'll make the benchmark more uh, reasonable. And so we added constant short-lived allocations in between each iteration to see how it affects it. And as you can see, that the gap between pooling versus standard allocation has reduced. We went one step further, and we made that al short-lived allocation proportional to the size of the object that you're pulling. And now, as you can see, after a certain size, the overhead of pooling is more than standard allocation. And the main reason behind this is that even though by pooling you are reducing the number of GC cycles that gets invoked, but you are increasing the memory footprint of your program. You have more objects each time to collect or to process. And of course, in addition to higher move footprint, there are many other disadvantages too, like you bring back all the nightmares of double free and memory leaks back. And also, given the narrow gap between allocation, standard allocation and pooling, it, may, it is very critical that your implementation of the pool itself is efficient. Otherwise, pooling would very quickly uh, uh, become more, uh, more inefficient as compared to standard allocation. So our recommendation is, that please don't use it unless you are really sure of the benefits. And the best way to be sure of benefits is to measure. If measure when you want to uh, introduce a new pool to your program, see if it benefits you, and then only um, use it. 
However, I still would say that there are some corner cases where it could be useful, right? So for instance, if, you are, uh, if your app has a requirement where very large objects uh, need to be used, and uh, then it may make sense to pull them. Or if there are thread local objects which uh, get allocated and then dropped on the floor at a very high frequency, then also it may make sense to pull them. But the, the key point is, please measure before deciding to use them. OK, so to recap, we uh, talked about how we improve the app startup time by, uh, by uh, using cloud profiles, by improving the app images, and by introducing the app process pools. Uh, on the GC's front, we already have fast object allocation since uh, Android Oreo. And uh, starting with Q, we have introduced the concept of generational garbage collection. And also, we improved the heap compaction using the two-phase algorithm that I talked about. And since it is our endeavor to always keep improving the art's performance, uh, we, expect, uh, we, will, we will continue to work, to work on these areas, and you can expect to have more improvements in the future to follow. With that, thanks a lot for attending the presentation. I hope it was useful. Mm -hmm.